Great. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project. This is Wednesday, March 31st, 2021, and welcome to the 55th session of MAVEN Project's COVID-19 update, led by Dr. Debbie Gold, a retired infectious disease doctor and hospital epidemiologist from Kaiser San Francisco. Dr. Gold is joined by MAVEN's physician volunteer panelists, Dr. Hunter Hansfield, infectious disease, Dr. Ramona Doyle, pulmonary and critical care, Dr. Lois Friedman, psychiatry, Dr. Judy and Smith, psychiatry, and Dr. Libby Sauter, obstetrics and gynecology. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and customized education sessions. Huge thank you to those of you who attend week after week and making time in your day for this weekly ritual. And please feel free to share these COVID session recordings with colleagues and friends, and you may invite them to attend the live sessions as well. Um, also wanted to um, wish those of you um, who have um, celebrated their recent Jewish holiday and the upcoming Easter holiday, um, the best for you and your family. So I'll go ahead and turn that over to Dr. Gold. Um, so good morning and um... As always, what I say today is relevant to today because things are changing rapidly. I have a long agenda to get through, but I think I will get through all of it because a lot of these things are short. Uh, numbers are continuing to rise. Of course, there is um, a huge amount of spread in uh, the EU. Um, things are very dire in Brazil, and um, we're seeing uh, rises in cases and deaths more than before, um, with an increased number of cases of over 4 million just in the last week worldwide. Um, cases uh, now in the United States are starting to creep up at a higher rate, um, and deaths are pretty stable. I'll show you here the New York Times data from this morning. Um, uh, the seven-day rolling average is now 66,000 cases a day. And you can see here that we have had a steady rise over the last um, the last couple of weeks. Um, this is an ominous sign, and it is what uh, Rochelle Walensky was talking about when she said she has um, a feeling of impending doom. We had a pro, uh, when we, we, we learned a lesson um, when we had the um, peak in the summer months. Um, we did not get down close to baseline before things started to open up, and we ended up with this huge peak in the winter. And now we're sort of in the same position. We didn't get down very close to baseline at all. Things are starting to open up, and we are starting to see an increased rise which may portend a fourth wave coming. So I think we're not in a very good place. And in fact, the um, number of cases have increased by 20% in the last two weeks. So um, things are, are definitely moving in the wrong direction overall in the United States. Um, deaths are seven day rolling average, still seeing about a thousand deaths a day, which is the same as last week. And we would not expect to see an increase in deaths um, for several weeks after we start to see increases in cases. Ha hospitalizations have um, smoothed out. We are still seeing about 40,000 people hospitalized every day. That's the same as last week. Um, so we have not yet started to see an increase in hospitalizations, but I should mention that in Michigan, that is one of the ground zeros for the um, uptick in cases um, that we've been seeing in the last couple of weeks has had a something like 400% increase in hospitalizations. And most of those are in individuals under the age of 50. Um, AstraZeneca, I mentioned last week, did a press release that, um, uh, announcing their phase three US data results. And, the net, and I showed those to you last week. The next day, uh, the Data Safety Monitoring Board um, issued a press release questioning the quality of the AstraZeneca data, saying that they had used outdated data and their um, results were uh, perhaps in question. So there was a press release March 25th, two days later by AstraZeneca announcing revised US data results. And the revision uh, reduced their efficacy overall from 79 to 76%, but increased the efficacy for individuals over 65 
from 80 to 85 percent, and there was no overall change in efficacy for preventing severe disease and hospitalizations. So that was that was good news. On the CDC is now uh, presenting uh, variants by state, and um, they. They only include 19 states here, so not all states are reporting data like this, but you can see here for California, over half of the cases in California that are being reported are B1.427 slash 429, which is the California variant. Um, this California variant is also being seen in 41% of the Nevada cases and five to 10% of cases in New York, Texas, Florida, Connecticut, and Missouri. So it is spreading rapidly across the United States. Um, because of this problem, HHS has now stopped distribution of banlamivimab, period. No states are receiving distribution of this monoclonal antibody because of the rapid rise of the California variant across the United States and also increasing um, uh, numbers of cases with the New York variant B1526, which also um, does not respond to this monoclonal antibody. Uh, of note, HHS is continuing to distribute the combination Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody of um, bamlanivimab, bamlanivimab and atesivimab, atesivimab. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I call it B and E, which I used to refer to as breaking and entering, but B and E will continue to be distributed in uh, to all states and does have efficacy against these variants. GlaxoSmithKline and Ver Biotechnology have a new monoclonal antibody, and they did a press release a couple of days ago. Um, the uh, monoclonal antibody has this very cumbersome name, but we'll just call it VER7831. It targets a highly conserved epitope on the spike protein, and that may make it more difficult for resistance to develop. The epitope is so highly conserved that, that it also appears on the uh, spike protein of the original SARS virus that was uh, caused a pandemic in 2002-2003. Uh, there are good in vitro data suggesting that the monoclonal antibody has activity against all of the variants of concern that we're dealing with right now. And there was phase three data that uh, a little bit of these, these data were released in the announcement. There were 583 patients who were enrolled and there was an 85% reduction in risk for hospitalization or death compared to placebo. This was highly statistically significant. So the company is now seeking emergency use authorization for treatment of individuals over the age of 12 who are at risk for progression to hospitalization or death, which is the same uh, indication as the other monoclonal antibodies. Uh, this morning, Pfizer announced their uh, data from their adolescent trial. They enrolled over 2,000 adolescents who were um, randomized to either vaccine or placebo. I don't know if they used reduced dose vaccine in this age group. Um, they didn't say in the press release. There were 18 cases of COVID in the placebo group and none in the vaccine group, which translates to 100% efficacy. These kids did mount very robust antibody responses, even higher than the 16 to 25 year old age group. There, the vaccine was well tolerated and no safety signals were identified. Um, Pfizer plans to submit these data to the FDA for expansion of their emergency use authorization down to the age of 12. Last week, Pfizer began, uh, Pfizer and Moderna began enrolling kids between the ages of six months and 12 years old. Um, Pfizer is testing several dosing, um, dosing levels. Um, the results are expected in the second half of this year. AstraZeneca uh, began a similar trial last month and Johnson & Johnson is planning the same in the future. It's really important for us to understand whether young children uh, will respond to this vaccine and how well it will be tolerated and what the correct dose is. 
23% uh, of the uh, population in this country is below the age of 18. So as the more adults uh, reject this vaccine or are hesitant to take it, the more children we will need to be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity. Um, AstraZeneca is, um, I, I think I mentioned several months ago, they were thinking about trying to use their vaccine in an inhaled form, and they are now starting a trial of vaccine administered by the nasal root, very much like flu mist, which is also made by AstraZeneca. So they do have some um, experience with this, uh, using this route for administration of vaccination. They're going to enroll 30 healthy volunteers and they are looking basically for a local immune response, particularly IgA in the respiratory tract. So more data to come on that. Um, this is a study from uh, Switzerland. It's actually not a study, but a case series about um, an unusual uh, adverse event that occurred in after they had administered over 13,000 vaccinations. Um, the, the policy there is to uh, do vital signs on any vaccine recipient who reports any symptoms compatible with any serious event during their waiting period. And they identified nine patients with stage three hypertension that was documented within several minutes of uh, receiving vaccination. Stage three hypertension is a systolic pressure uh, 180 or higher, or a diastolic pressure of 120 or higher. Um, eight of the, the nine of these individuals had a prior history of well-controlled hypertension. Um, one of them, um, uh, got up and left, a 77-year-old woman refused to be uh, evaluated, which I thought was really just stunning. Anyway, they um, complained of a number of different kinds of symptoms, malaise, chest pain, diaphoresis, um, and anxiety. And so I guess this is something just to keep in mind if you are um, vaccinating patients in your facility. Um, the WHO has um, issued a warning this week about um, items that are now available on the dark web. Um, you can purchase doses of AstraZeneca, Sputnik, and Sin Sinopharm and the uh, J&J vaccines um, for $500 to $70, $750 each. In fact, there has been a tripling of vaccine advertising on the dark web since January, some uh, guaranteeing next day delivery. Um, you have to be aware if you are buying vaccine on the dark web that uh, the vaccine could be counterfeit and they are actually using old uh, vials and filling them with saline uh, and selling those as a legitimate vaccine. They're also selling stolen COVID vaccine. There's very little oversight in um, some centers of, and so a diversion of COVID vaccine has been occurring. I'm not sure if that's in the United States or uh, outside of the United States. Um, they are also selling vac fake vaccine certificates for travelers for $150 and fake negative test results for travelers for also for $150. Um, as I've mentioned almost every week, Israel is uh, very far ahead of, the, uh, of any other country in um, being able to uh, vaccinate the, the bulk of their population. And they have been coming up with incentives to try to get to uh, individuals who uh, may be more uh, hesitant to get vaccine. So they set up a pop-up clinic in a bar in Tel Aviv, um, and they are calling this care for a shot with your shot. Um, and uh, they are offering uh, not, not shots, but a free beer or a non-alcoholic peach drink if you get a, a, a vaccine in the bar and they actually had a line around the block. So it was very popular. They've also been focusing on food to try and lure people. So free pizza, free hummus and free knafe. And I would get in line for knafe if you've never eaten it. It's a rather wonderful uh, pastry. Um, and then in the ultra Orthodox neighborhoods, um, they have been offering cholent to try and uh, lure people. And um, I, I get nauseated even when I say that word cholent, it's a mixture of meat and beans and it's just really awful. Um, they are off also ha uh, offering uh, green pass to individuals who 
have completed their vaccination series, and this allows them to uh, enter entertainment areas uh, and to use gyms and to travel. So um, my younger son has now just um, obtained his green pass, and he says that there are green passes available, um, forged green passes available for sale online. He couldn't tell me how much they cost, though. Vaccine incentives are now being used in the United States to try and convince people to come in for vaccinations. Chobani yogurt is being given to vaccinees in some sites. Um, there is a, an arcade, I can't remember the state, I should have put it down, it's go, who, they have a program called Tokens for Pokens, and they're giving $5 in arcade tokens to people who have completed their vaccination series. In Cleveland, uh, they are offering 10 cent beers in a brewery, and um, they have a, a cinema um, chain that is offering free 44 ounce popcorn. Um, and then in Michigan, this is the best one. They have a, a marijuana dispensary that is offering a free pre-roll joint for anyone who has completed their vaccination series. And then of course, Uber has been giving free or discounted rides to individuals to try to get them uh, uh, vaccinated. But we do still have a long way to go. Um, there has been a, 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 a great gap in vaccinations for Hispanic, uh, the Hispanic community in many states. And this graphic from the New York Times from a couple of days ago demonstrates it um, very well. Um, for example, um, in New Mexico, Hispanic people make up 38% of those vaccinated in the state, but they comprise almost 50% of the population. In Texas, um, the um, Hispanic uh, comprise about 20% of um, uh, vaccinees, but they comprise about 40% of the population and so on. And the trend continues um, in many states. There, uh, we have a long way to go to, go to get the Hispanic uh, population vaccinated. And there are many reasons why this is happening. They often have limited access to smartphones or computers that are needed to get appointments, or they may not understand what vaccine eligibility is or how to make the appointment or where to go because that information is only provided in English. They might be uh, unaware that the vaccine is free and concerned that they don't have health insurance and, and therefore might have to pay a large amount of money to get vaccinated. Um, they are often essential workers and afraid to miss work to try to meet a, to get to a vaccination appointment, or they might be aware of the uh, that the side effects of the vaccine could keep them out of work for a day or even two, and they can't afford to miss work. Um, of course, there is the ongoing concern about immigration status and being frightened about that issue. And then um, even in individuals who receive their first dose, there is often a misunderstanding about the need for a second dose. And so there's a high no-show rate for the second dose. Pfizer now has an oral antiviral medication. They announced this in a press release on March 23rd. Um, they, uh, it, of course, has a very cumbersome name. It is a protease inhibitor that has very good in vitro activity, not only against SARS-CoV-2, but also against the original SARS and MERS. A phase one trial in healthy adults is going to start uh, very soon to evaluate sa safety and tolerability. Um, and this will be a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, single and multiple dose escalation study. So I'm sure we will have more, there will be more to come um, on this oral antiviral. Um, there, uh, the FDA has announced another hand sanitizer recall. I think they recalled more than 75 hand sanitizers because of a methanol problem, and this is completely different. This is a Duracan hand sanitizer that is alcohol free. And if you are using this in your clinics for uh, healthcare workers who are unable to use alcohol containing hand sanitizer, you need to get rid of it because it, uh, the uh, Duracan has reported contamination of their product with Burkholderia cepatia and Ralstonia piquetii. There are three studies that were uh, published in the last week about the effectiveness or real world effectiveness of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, vaccine 
Um, the first one I'm going to tell you, and there were actually four, but I'm only going to show you three of the studies. This is one from University of Texas Southwestern that asked the question, what is the real world effect of mRNA vaccines on transmission of SARS-CoV-2 infection? They, uh, their medical center started vaccinating its 23,000 healthcare workers um, December 15th, and they used Moderna. They then measured the positivity in healthcare workers and compared it to the positivity in patients who were presenting to the emergency room during the same period of time who were um, tested for uh, COVID-19. So you can see here, um, this is the uh, percentage of employees with COVID-19 on this axis. These are the non-vaccinated um, employees and their, vac their uh, infection rate or positivity rate was two and a half percent. Individuals who were partially vaccinated or healthcare workers partially vaccinated had a positivity rate of 1.82%. And those who were fully vaccinated had a very low positivity rate of 0.05%. It should be noted that this was passive um, testing. These were individuals who were not uh, tested on a regular basis. You can see here the number of positive tests on this axis and time on this axis. And um, these are the, uh, each dot represents a positive, numbers of positive tests. And here is the beginning of the vaccination process. And here is, the blue line is 25 days later. And you can see that there is a dr dramatic drop off in the number of positive tests every day, which actually started to go down over time. And this was the, if uh, the trend was continued, this was the projected number of positive tests that would occur every day um, without vaccination. So, they concluded that there was a marked reduction in the incidence of infections in their healthcare workers with more than 90% decrease in the number of employees in isolation or quarantine, which allowed them to maintain their workforce. 78% um, of their healthcare workers were vaccinated by March 5th, which was the time they submitted this paper. Um, so, and that was disconcerting um, that they weren't able to vaccinate more, but there is a hesitancy in the population of healthcare workers and their vaccine hesitancy remains a challenge even when access is not an obstacle. And as I mentioned, it's unclear if surveillance of healthcare workers was active or passive and it really does matter. And I'll show you now a study where they did um, active surveillance, which um, reinforced these results. So this was a study, a very similar study done at UC San Diego and UCLA. They started vaccinating their healthcare workers December 16th and then set a low threshold to test symptomatic healthcare workers. But in addition to that, on December 2nd at UC San Diego, they began weekly PCR surveillance testing of asymptomatic healthcare workers. So that is active surveillance. They did not do this at UCLA, however, and they pooled the data from the two um, the two campuses. Um, so between December 16th and February 9th, they vaccinated over, uh, they got a first dose into almost 37,000 healthcare workers. And of these, um, 77 also received a second dose. So you can see here that um, they were very effective in, um, in reducing the numbers of new infections. They had 379 new infections between December 16th and February 9th. But if you look down here in the end, and most of these were in individuals who had received just a single dose of vaccine. And the farther away from the single dose you got, the lower the number of infections you had. But after the second dose, um, eight to 14 days after the second dose, they saw eight infections and 15 days or later, they saw seven infections. So a very low number of infections in individuals who had full vaccination. Um, they concluded that infection after mRNA vaccination can occur, but is rare. The efficacy of the vaccine is maintained outside of the context of a clinical trial but continued mitigation measures, including everything that we talk about every week are crucial, even in environments with high incidence of vaccination until herd immunity is reached in, um, in the country. 
Um, this was a CDC study that also used active surveillance to, uh, ans to answer the question about effectiveness. There were 3,950 participants in this study that included healthcare workers, first responders like police and fire, and other essential workers. They were tested by self-collected PCR every week that they mailed, they take, took swabs themselves and mailed them in. And they took these swabs regardless of symptoms, but if they did develop symptoms, then they, they also tested at the onset of symptoms. So of these participants, 63% received both doses of vaccine, 12% received a single, 25% were unvaccinated. Of note, and importantly, the majority of these individuals uh, in participating in the study were white, female, and between the ages of 18 and 49. And uh, also importantly, they had all, largely no medical comorbidities. And you can see here in um, the, uh, compared to unvaccinated, the partially immunized individuals whether uh, 14 days after the first dose um, had an adjusted vaccine effectiveness of 80% of the fully immunized individuals 14 days after the second dose had an adjusted vaccine effectiveness of 90%. So this is really good news. Uh, the conclusions were that MRSA, mRNA vaccines are highly effective in real world conditions. They protect against symptomatic and asymptomatic infection, and that will reduce forward transmission of infection. Um, and this isn't really a conclusion, but just something that they said in the paper, and I didn't know where else to, to put it. The viruses that they have recovered from these individuals with uh, infection will be genetically characterized to examine the viral features of breakthrough infections. There were some limitations. Um, the vaccine vaccine effectiveness point estimates should be interpreted with caution given the moderately wide confidence intervals, which I didn't show you, um, attributable to the small number of post-immunization events, uh, PCR positive events. Um, in, these individuals were collecting um, specimens themselves, and so they could have made errors in the self-collection of the specimens, or there could have been delays in shipment. Um, with our current postal service that could have reduced the sensitivity of virus detection by PCR. And I, I put this in as a limitation, although they didn't. The population study was young, healthy, and majority white. And I think that uh, these um, the effectiveness uh, conclusions might not be generalizable to the uh, population at large. This is a study about remdesivir effectiveness in the real world um, that was done at Johns Hopkins. It was a retrospective multi-center comparative study. And it asked the question, does the time to clinical improvement or death differ among hospitalized patients treated with and without remdesivir alone or with corticosteroids for COVID-19 outside the context of a clinical trial? So they looked at 2,483 consecutive admissions between March and August of last year. 184 of these received remdesivir and steroids combined. 158 received remdesivir alone. And 81% of these were non-white. And that's really important because in the ACTT1 study of remdesivir, they did not have nearly this amount of non-white participants. Uh, the primary outcome was the rate of clinical improvement, um, either hospital discharge or a decrease of two points on the WHO severity score, which goes from um, hospital, um, hospital discharge, I believe, with complete, uh, with no restrictions on activity all the way to death. And there are, um, it's a scale, I can't remember, I think there may be eight, um, eight categories in the scale. Um, and so it's a decrease of two points um, in the correct direction um, for, to qualify for clinical improvement. And then secondary outcome was 28-day mortality. This is a Kaplan-Meier plot showing time to clinical improvement for all patients. And you can see here that the two um, 
The blue line is the remdesivir line. The control line is the gold line. There is very little overlap uh, between the confidence limits. And in fact, the um, adjusted hazard ratio of 1.47 was statistically significant. Um, the time to clinical improvement for the remdesivir group was five days and for the control was seven days. And so um, that was a clinically uh, significant improvement and um, echoed the discovery uh, trial or the, uh, not the discovery, the ACTT1 trial, which showed about a one day improvement, uh, in, um, quicker improvement in the remdesivir group. These are the, this is the time to clinical improvement for mild to moderate disease. Again, the blue line is remdesivir, the gold line is control. And for mild to moderate disease, clinical improvement from the remdesivir group was five days and for the control, six days. This is, um, and there was no uh, significant difference for severe disease um, as was also seen in the ACTT1 trial. Um, patient survival for all patients. Um, the remdesivir 28 day mortality was 7.7% and control mortality was 14%. And that was actually not statistically significant. Again, echoing the re uh, results of the ACTT1 trial. They also looked at clinical improvement by receipt of uh, remdesivir plus corticosteroids versus remdesivir alone in this Kaplan-Meier. You can see the remdesivir plus steroids is the blue um, jagged line and the uh, gold is remdesivir alone. Um, there was not a statistically significant difference between these two groups. Um, and looking at survival, uh, the remdesivir group uh, is the alone is the gold line and the remdesivir plus steroids um, uh, group is the blue line. And actually the remdesivir plus steroids group um, had, uh, you know what, there's no, even though these look different, there's no st statistical dis difference between these two groups. Um, so even though, um, there were 22 deaths in the uh, remdesivir group at 28 days and 40 deaths or um, almost double in the control group. Those were not considered statistically significant. Um, in so the conclusions were that remdesivir was associated with a significantly shorter time to clinical recovery among patients admitted to the hospital for treatment for COVID-19. Patients with the least severe disease benefited the most, again, echoing the ACTT trial. And remdesivir alone or in combination with corticosteroids were not associated with a mortality benefit, again, echoing the results of the ACTT trial. They did say that the design of this study uh, was likely underpowered to detect a mortality difference between the patients receiving remdesivir and matched controls. Um, my last paper, so I'm going to finish early, is um, uh, neurological symptoms uh, in long COVID. This was a study that was reported from Northwestern, and it was a prospective observational study that asked the question, what is the spectrum of neurologic manifestations in non-hospitalized patients with long COVID? They looked at the first 100 consecutive patients who presented to their neuro COVID-19 clinic between May and November of last year. Importantly, 50% of these individuals had laboratory positive um, documentation of COVID. Um, that means they either had a positive PCR or they had a positive antibody test or they had a positive antigen test. There were 50 individuals who were laboratory negative. They didn't have any positive confirmation of having had COVID, but they had compatible symptoms. Um, if I were designing this study, I would not have used this group as a control group, but moving right along, um, they included patients if they met the Infectious Disease Society of America uh, criteria for symptoms of COVID-19, and, and they had to not have been hospitalized for pneumonia or hypoxemia and had neurological symptoms lasting at least six weeks. 
they could have been hospitalized for a COVID related disease other than pneumonia or hypoxemia, however. So the mean age of this group is 43, 70% of them were women and the median BMI is 25.4. So in the overweight range and there were a number of individuals who were in, in the obese range, 88% of them were white. And this kind of demographic is the demographic that I used to see in patients who had chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I did a study when I was a fellow um, and this is the kind of patients that I would see. Um, the uh, individuals had a lot of pre-existing comorbidities that uh, potentially uh, contributed to their, um, their, the symptoms that they then developed post-COVID. 42% um, of them had depression or, and or anxiety. 16% um, of them each had autoimmune disease, insomnia, or underlying lung disease. And you can see here um, the neurological signs and symptoms attributed to COVID-19. And I'm just gonna focus here on the overall symptoms. This is divided into the SARS-CoV-2 positive and SARS-CoV-2 negative groups that were, again, uh, these individuals had positive confirmation. These individuals had no confirmation, but just focusing on this, cat, this line, which is the overall, um, this column is, which is overall time from onset of, of symptoms to um, presenting in their clinic was um, a little over five months. So these people really had very long-term symptoms. Um, the subjective impression of recovery compared to pre-COVID-19 baseline, um, only 20% of them felt, or almost 21% felt that they had um, recovered compared to their baseline. And the number of neurological symptoms attributed to COVID-19, the median was five. Um, so that is a lot of neurological symptoms. The most common was brain fog that 81% of, of um, complained of, 68% complained of headache, 60% numbness tingling, uh, altered taste in 59%, altered smell in 55%, and then myalgias, pain, blurred vision, tinnitus in um, still in a substantial numbers from 47% uh, down to 29%. Uh, only a little over half of them actually had any abnormality identified on physical exam. A third of them had short-term memory deficit and 20%, 27% of them had attention deficit um, when they were tested um, formally for that. Um, and these individuals all went through a um, quality of life um, questionnaire and also had cognitive testing using the NIH toolbox for that purpose. Um, and you can see here that individuals who had documented COVID um, were significantly uh, more likely to have a cognitive impairment compared to a normative population um, and were significantly more likely to have fatigue um, compared to a normative population. This was sex and age matched controls. And um, so their quality of life was significantly diminished compared to controls. And looking at the NIH toolbox, which measured their cognitive ability, um, there was a statistically significant um, diminution in their attention ability, which I mentioned previously. And also their working memory was statistically significantly diminished compared to controls. So the conclusions were that non-hospitalized patients with long COVID experience prominent and persistent brain fog and fatigue that affect their cognition and quality of life. Um, it should be noted that there are a lot of limitations to this study. First of all, the sample size was quite small. The majority was white. And so these data are not generalizable to the rest of the population. They didn't have any pre-COVID-19 data on quality of life or cognitive assessment with which to compare. And some of the SARS-CoV-2 negative participants could have had post-viral syndrome related to other viral infections, which is why I um, object to them using that particular um, a control group, but so it is. 
And um, so this was a highly selective population of largely white women who made their way to this COVID-19 um, neuro clinic. Um, so I think you have to keep that in mind in interpreting um, the results of this study. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to entertain questions. I haven't finished this early in ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Wonderful. Well, you actually had a lot of fun and interesting, you know, facts and discussions today. So I really appreciate that. So we'll move on to questions and um, to our audience. Please feel free to submit them in the Q&A um, box on your Zoom toolbar. Can you comment on how long you have seen patients that continue to have lack of taste and smell post COVID infection? So um, the, in this study that I just showed, there were, I think, 50 to 60% of, of, the, of the 100 patients had persistent alterations in taste and smell. Um, it certainly can, act, it can last many weeks. And um, it, it, yeah, so it can last many weeks. And, this, and so the, the data that I just showed you, again, was in a highly selective group of, of individuals. I should mention that um, in this last week, The Daily, which is the New York Times podcast, did an interview with one of their food critics who had a loss of smell um, from COVID, a loss of taste and smell, which for her in developing recipes and tasting food in restaurants is um, very life changing, and um, in that, in the course of that interview, she herself did a lot of um, research on the loss of taste and smell and how to get it back again, um, and lots of things that are circulating online that don't work. Um, but she did come up with um, a variant of sniffing sticks, which I had discussed in the past, which is a way to retrain your brain to identify smells. And instead of using, I think there were um, 24 sniffing sticks that you can buy online from Amazon for $300, they just used four sp spices um, and did a kind of training of um, smell that way where you just kind of do little bunny sniffs of the spices, smelling those spices every day to try and re retrain your brain. So anyway, it was the, the daily from sometime in the last week um, that, was quite interesting to listen to. If you have patients who um, have, have had a loss of taste and smell, you might want to refer them to that podcast. Thank you. Is there anyone who should not receive the vaccine besides someone with known anaphylaxis to an ingredient in the vaccine, specifically one with a peanut allergy anaphylaxis? So um, individuals who have um, known sensitivity to polyethylene glycol. Um, they, you know, I think that they're, oh God, I can't remember what the CDC said, if those people should be vaccinated with caution or they should be, or they should wait for a preparation that doesn't contain polyethylene glycol. I'm sorry, I can't remember that, but the, both of the mRNA vaccines do contain it. I believe J&J &J does not contain it. Um, so I think that they, those individuals receive vaccination with caution and with caution means they're observed for 30 minutes post vaccination. I can, I can look it up and put it in my reference list um, just to, to make absolutely sure. But I think it's only, in, um, you know, there isn't an absolute contraindication to receiving uh, the mRNA vaccines. Um, yeah. Um, I'll put it in my um, references. I'll, I'll, I'll post the, uh, the answer after I look it up again. Great. Thanks, Dr. Gold. And so if you have an anaphylaxis to pe a peanut anaphylaxis, you can still receive the vaccine. You just have to be observed for 30 minutes. And I might even observe that person for a, an hour. Um, so the anaphylaxis to other things, even in injectables, you know, th those are not contraindication to receiving the, uh, the MRI maybe, vaccines. Maybe you'd also agree that such persons should be vaccinated in a clinical setting other than say a pharmacy, no, that sort of thing. Not in a pharmacy. And I probably wouldn't even do it in a super site. I would do it in, uh, I, I would do it in a medical setting. Yeah, clinical, clinical I, medical. I totally agree with that. And you should bring your own EpiPens 
even though you know they'll have you know they they're supposed to have EpiPens on on hand, but I would sort of bring an EpiPen that you could give yourself right away while they're like scrambling to get more if they need it. Great. Um, let's see. Can you or uh, this the the comment or question is phrased problem comparing long COVID to people who have undergone other types of illness, stress, hospitalization, not done. Yeah. Okay, so long COVID is a mix of individuals who have, say, been in the hospital and been in the ICU for a prolonged period of time on a ventilator. And those patients clearly will have a very protracted course after their discharge and will have lots of fatigue and shortness of breath and other kinds of symptoms because they had severe disease. And they are now being lumped in with individuals who have long, long COVID or symptoms beyond 28 days after onset of symptoms um, who had mild disease or just moderate disease and who probably have prolonged symptoms based on a completely different mechanism but it's really unclear at this time what the mechanism is for the, for the latter group. The former group we see all the time in individuals who have been hospitalized for other reasons and who have had, who are very debilitated and deconditioned when they're discharged home from the hospital and have a prolonged um, convalescence. I would, I would endorse that. There are several groups around the country that uh, based on anecdotal reports and conferences they've given that are now systematically starting clinical studies. Uh, and uh, as I agree 100% Debbie that it's highly heterogeneous. Some are just overlap with any of the syndromes we see all the time, people who have been ill. Uh, some of them physiologic, some of them psychogenic uh, and so on. One, the group studying is the University of Washington, for example, laments the even terminology of long COVID or long haulers and that sort of thing because it's so nonspecific and maybe will evolve towards something like post COVID inflammatory syndrome or something like that, that hopefully will maybe someday set out some people with a fairly defined set of manifestations, but we're still, we're still, that, that's still sometime in the future. In the meantime, keep your antennae up for developments and improved understanding as time goes on. It's a very uncertain field. I have, I've seen some very respected clinicians uh, who have, in fact, a, a neurologist, an academic neurologist who I respect tremendously at the University of Washington said in a conference the other day that her understanding and belief in the nature and the important concepts of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia and that thing have been enhanced with her having a more accepting and believable understanding of those syndromes because of what she's now seeing in post COVID patients. So we'll see how this sorts out over time. It's an interesting area, but still pretty, pretty uncertain. There's also um, a neurologist at Stanford who thinks that a lot of these patients with long COVID um, may have POTS. And um, in fact, there were four patients in the Northwestern study who had tilt table um, testing and three of them had uh, abnormal tilt table tests. So there may be even a sort of autonomic dysfunction that happens in these patients and that, that may compose a, a very small group um, who have formal POTS disease because they you know, patients will complain of tachycardia and dizziness and, and that kind of thing, which is really reminiscent of POTS. Thank you. And then just a, a follow-up comment from Dr. Um, Lighty. Um, the CDC says, this is about the anaphylaxis with the vaccines. The CDC says not to receive mRNA vaccine if allergic to PEG, the polyethylene glycol. Oh, okay. Oh, Thank you, yeah. Beth. Yes. Okay. And then we were um, fellows together at the University of Washington <laughs> Great. decades she, ago. Thank you, Beth. And she follows up, may be able to get the Johnson & Johnson if a PEG allergy, um, if allergic to polysorbate should avoid J&J, &J, may be able to get mRNA vaccine. So, great. Thank you, Beth. So uh, the mRNA vaccines also contain polysorbate. Mm -hmm. um, right. But maybe it's not very much. So. Thank you. 
Can you comment on Canada's decision to allow AstraZeneca vaccine only for those over 55? Yeah, so um, Canada and I think Germany may have made a similar um, recommendation uh, to restrict the use of AstraZeneca over the age of 55 because of the possibility of um, thromboembolic phenomena that have been occurring in mostly people under the age of 55. Um, there is a, a potential explanation for the development of this um, of these thromboembolic events and that these individuals get activation of their platelets in response to vaccination. Um, and I, it is my understanding that it's mostly young people who have developed clots. And so they just said, okay, we're just gonna give it to older people until we understand better why it's happening and whether it is really even related to the vaccine itself. Um, uh, and um, I can, you know, I've sort of looked at the paper that tries to explain um, the, you know, that offers an explanation for why this is happening. And I didn't quite understand it. I really was, in, hematology was never my forte, um, but I'll try and uh, put it in my talk for next week and see if I can figure it out. There are so many things that were not my forte. Uh, but there are many things that are, Dr. Gold, don't forget. Um, <laughs> question, um, projected safety of travel to Africa late this summer or early fall? I have no idea. I have to say that, um, you know, I think it's going to depend on what happens with the speed of vaccination. I will tell you that Africa is behind other parts of the world in rolling out vaccination and even being able to obtain vaccine through COVAX. Um, so the safety of travel, especially somewhere like Africa, where a very small percentage of the population will be vaccinated by summer or fall, I, I think that's a little bit scary because there's going to be not only B1351 there, but probably other variants as well as the as the infection spreads through the entire pop, the entire continent and is able to replicate at a very high level and produce more and more variants um, to be worried about, and that might evade um, protection that's conferred by the current vaccinations that we have. Pfizer and Moderna are both working on boosters that will have hopefully enhanced activity against B1351, which we know is circulating in Africa. Um, but who knows whether those vaccines will be um, successful and whether they would be commercially available by the end of summer or, or early fall. I don't know. Thank you. Does 80% of the population um, having the vaccine develop herd immunity? So as, um, so I think we initially thought that maybe herd immunity would be achieved at 70, 75%. However, um, with the circulation of more transmissible variants, the threshold for herd immunity keeps getting pushed up higher and higher. So it looks like maybe 85% is what I've, I've heard most recently. Um, and because of that, um, we are going to need to have children vaccinated. Um, we're not gonna be able to just vaccinate all the adults and be done with it um, because 23% of the population is under 18. Uh, we're not gonna get to 85% without vaccinating children. And there are even more transmissible viruses that come on this on the radar, then that might push the uh, herd immunity up even higher. There was a study that found a decrease in death from COVID in individuals on statins. Any comments? I presented the statin study a long time ago. Um, I, you know what, I just don't remember the details of it. Um, I only kind of remember the details of the stuff that I've read in the last week. So um, I will try and look for the statin study and I'll put it on the reference list, maybe with a little comment. 
um, but I, I haven't looked at it in a long time. It's not a recent study. Well, recent, I mean, <laughs> it's, not, it's not from the last month or two. It's, from, it's older than that. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll look for that. Um, let me write that down too. There was recently a study that was published about fluvoxamine. I think that's the drug, fluvoxamine. A, another study showing decreased progression of infection um, in, in taking this antidepressant. Um, so I think I'm gonna present that uh, one I'd next be, week. I'd be, I'd be careful about any single risk factor when there's a single report and you don't see follow-up reports uh, on it. Uh, and, you know, there's not, and also, I'd be a little skeptical about reports that don't have obvious biological plausibility, and I don't, off the top of my head, see any obvious bi biological reasons. There was a, a, um, a plausibility with the fluvoxamine. It was some anti-inflammatory thing. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they kind of made an argument that it was plausible that it might have some effect. Oh, Lois. Yeah, no, you're right about that. And but what I can say is that fluvoxamine is not very commonly used and it's not a drug anybody should be prescribing for that reason. So, yeah. Yeah, it's TID. It has a lot of drug interactions. Yeah, um, yeah so. <laughs> Bottom of the list. <laughs> Um, the next is a comment from one of our MAVEN Project rheumatology volunteers, Dr. Bernhard. The post-COVID syndrome is also typical of fibromyalgia. This is frequently an occurrence post-influenza, et cetera. It will be critical to have pre-morbid um, promise or similar data on these long haulers. Great, thank you, Gers. And if one has a history of anaphylaxis, but did fine with one's first dose of an mRNA vaccine, is there any risk of anaphylaxis for the second dose? I think there is some risk and that person would still be uh, observed for 30 minutes at least after the second dose, but um, there's not a, there, is a, there is a small risk and, um, but it's not a contraindication to having the second dose. Does vaccination help long COVID? So I presented some data last week or two, maybe two weeks ago, because there've been some anecdotal, there's been some anecdotes of patients with long COVID who have said that they have improved significantly after receiving vaccination. And there was a small study that suggested that patients, at least some patients, might improve um, after receiving vaccinations. Certainly not all of them. Um, and they might not improve to back to their baseline, but um, there is some data now to suggest, and it's very preliminary data to suggest that vaccination might help some patients with long COVID. Just to say what we all should always remember that anecdotes are, the plural of anecdote is not data. And right. the fact that there are even several anecdotes doesn't tell you very much. And particularly with something, a, a syndrome or group of syndromes that are so diffuse and as yet poorly defined as uh, long haul COVID. Um, we just, just hold tight a little bit and don't overreact to single reports. As, as people define the syndrome or the various natures of the syndrome and perhaps begin to understand pathophysiology, uh, th these will become clear, but it's not gonna be in the immediate next week or two. It's gonna take, take time. But the, the publication was actually a study. It wasn't uh, just a collection yeah. of, I mean, it was a little study. Um, yeah, even with a little study, study even, very preliminary, but what, what, Certainly, what, long COVID is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine. And what, On the contrary, group, those patients should be vaccinated. What at the current state of affairs, what one group includes in their definition of what they call these patients long COVID could be very different from the next group. So there could be heterogeneity in the populations that are so characterized. Just just keep keep a uh, healthy dose of skepticism in your minds as you see these things in the hope that things will become clearer as the months pass. Thank you. Um, are you aware of menstrual issues, menstrual abnormalities affecting female patients post-infection and under the definition of long COVID? 
Are you concerned about a future public health crisis with a broad spectrum of long COVID symptoms? The public health crisis, you know, there's going to be a huge burden of patients with long COVID that we're going to be seeing for years to come. And so you should be prepared for that. But um, maybe Libby knows or of some- um, I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen anything. Abnormalities. Um, it, you know, most of it would have to do with stress, if anything, you know, which can cause menstrual abnormalities. But I haven't seen anything. And um, the only one thing I've seen recently is that actually um, when you, compare and and you know get rid of all the cofactors polycystic ovarian disease which typically actually presents in people that have other comorbidities like you know um, diabetes metabolic syndrome they're obese but when you you know factor that in they uh, they do show an increased risk for covid but that's only a risk factor for something it's not you know a, a result of covid affecting them later. Mm -hmm. And one of our gynecology um, attendees wrote, um, she has not seen that, um, uh, just mostly stress, stress, yes. stress issues. So stress thanks, doc thanks, Dr. Imhoff. Very great. Thank you, Dr. Sauter. Um, do you have any idea about how long immunity in vaccinated people will last? So, there are, so that, you know, the CDC is still with the 90 days business that there's very good data. There's a good data that it's six months, maybe seven, eight or nine months um, now. So the longer we go, the longer we get data on the people who were in the phase three studies. Um, and so it looks like, you know, six, seven, maybe eight months, maybe longer. Um, I don't think we know. I did see something yesterday or maybe this morning about a possible drop off at one year, but we're not really one year out yet. So um, anyway, I, I think we don't know. And, uh, but it's definitely more than 90 days. Um, it's definitely more than six months and, and possibly now data going out as long as nine months. Thank you. Um, and then from one of our physician attendees, um, unfortunately her mom, uh, who was I think maybe in her seventies with underlying moderate Alzheimer's, unfortunately had a significant ad adverse event um, after the second vaccine. And so her question is, um, let's see. So she um, unfortunately had uh, seizures the day after her first Pfizer vaccine. And then she had a massive stroke 16 oh. after, hours after the second dose. So we're really sorry to hear that. And um, she's on, on, on hospice now. Um, she was you know, at high risk for both of her events. Um, and, um, but the timing was kind of suspicious and the VAERS were submitted. But her concern is that in many of these mass vaccination events, there is no ongoing relationship with patients for reporting to be reliable. Many of our mass vaccination event patients do not opt to sign up for the CDC self-reporting app. And do you have any comments about that? That's true. And um, I don't think that the VSAFE is being um, pushed very hard. Where I got my vaccinations, there was just like a little pile of handouts at the end. Nobody said, you know, you should sign up for this. Um, but when big events like that happen, hopefully the physicians or even individuals, you know, if you are a relative, you can report to VAERS. Um, they will take reports from anybody and will definitely follow up um, because it's, it's crucial that we understand uh, whether events like that are really related to vaccine or not. Um, and so anybody can report to VAERS, not just the providers, but I, I agree it's probably inconsistent because it's, it's a little time consuming, so. Great, wonderful. Well, those are our um, questions for today. Um, again, excellent questions, everyone. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for all of your knowledge and sharing that with us. Um, and for all of our attendees, we love seeing you here. We love your questions and we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, same time and same place. I hope everybody has a terrific week.